Welcome back to day two of the clinical oncology track of the Asia Pacific Japan Genetic Solution Tour 2020. I'm Ray, I'm back and I'm the moderator for this session. Today, uh, we will continue to discuss the clinical oncology topics around microsatellite instability and liquid biopsy application, which is of high interest in the last few years. So for our first speaker, we'll hear from Dr. Charles Fado, who is a molecular biologist in the Genetic Sciences Division, Clinical Vertical, as a Thermal Fisher Scientific. And his development efforts are focused on oncology application. Recently, he, he was the lead developer on the Applied Biosystem TrueMark MSI assay, a new MSI detection kit with an expanded marker set and automated analysis. For a complete biography on our speaker, please visit the tab at the top of your screen. Today, Tsubato will be sharing with us some of his work and to showcase the combination of our expanded panel and automated analysis software constitute an important tool for studying MSI. If any question arise during the presentation, we encourage you to submit them in the Q&A box. Our speaker will address your question following his presentation. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Bardo now I will turn the presentation over to him. Thank you for that introduction. Hello, and thank you for joining this webinar today. My name is Charles Bauto, and I'm an R&D scientist at Thermo Fisher Scientific in the Genetic Sciences Division, Clinical Vertical. Our job is to develop content across the infectious disease and oncology space, and today I will show you an oncology application, a fragment analysis test to detect the presence of microsatellite instability, or MSI, in tumors. First, I'm going to give you a background on what MSI is, describe the detection method that we have developed over the past two years, and detail the performance of the kit on clinical research samples. But first, some background on microsatellite instability. In 1997, Bethesda guidelines were established with the main goal of standardizing microsatellite instability testing in an, in an inherited form of colorectal cancer termed the Lynch syndrome. In 2004, those criteria were revised because the original guidelines included dinucleotide repeats and these were found to be less sensitive. Until 2017, microsatellite testing was mostly performed to identify cancers with inherited mutations in genes that affect DNA mismatch repair. However, with the approval of Keytruda and other immunotherapies, microsatellite testing has become even more prevalent as any deficient mismatch repair or microsatellite instability high cancer could be treated with these drugs. MSI testing has been traditionally done using immunohistochemistry or through fluorescent PCR followed by fragment analysis on capillary electrophoresis instruments. The figure here shows a fragment analysis result of five mononucleotide markers. The x-axis in this figure is the amplicon size and the y-axis is fluorescent. The top panel is the normal tissue and the bottom panel is the tumor tissue. In the normal tissue, we see one set of peaks associated with the marker here, and the same set of peaks in the tumor sample. Also in the tumor sample here, we see a second set of stutter peaks, which is associated with the deletion in this amplicon. And so you, and so this phenotype here is microsatellite instability. On the next slide, I'll show you what we are actually measuring in microsatellite unstable tumors. Microsatellite instability is the change in length of small repeat units in the genome. 
in this diagram on the top, we can see an eight mononucleotide repeat example here. On the left side of the diagram, mismatch repair proteins identify polymerase slippage that happens during DNA replication and corrects the number of repeat units. We began with eight and we end with eight. And this is considered microsatellite stable. However, on the right, replication slippage results in the number of repeat units changing from eight to four and the replication error is missed due to deficient mismatch repair proteins. This is called microsatellite instability. It's really important to study MSI because there are cancers with inherited mutations and genes that affect DNA mismatch repair termed Lynch syndrome, and many people do not know that they have these mutations. An individual with Lynch syndrome has an increased lifetime risk of developing colorectal, endometrial, and other cancers. It's also important to study for immunotherapy research. Deficient mismatch repair, repair results in mutations throughout the genome, which produce neoantigens that prime an immune response in the presence of immunotherapy drugs. The slide, the next slide shows the mechanism of action for this. In general, microsatellite instability correlates with higher mutability in the tumor cell. Here in panel A, it shows a tumor with mismatch repair deficiency that produces neoantigens caused by a frame shift mutation throughout the genome, but PDL1, PD1 interaction between the tumor and the T cell blocks the activation of the T cell and blocks the clearance of the tumor cell. In panel B, we have the presence of a immunotherapy drug that binds either PD-1 or PDL one allowing the T cell to recognize the neoantigen here and to clear the tumor cell. On the left, we have a Kaplan-Meier curve that shows the overall survival of patients with PDL one drugs and um, in microsatellite high or microsatellite stable patients. And you can see that microsatellite instability high patients do better than microsatellite stable patients. The figure on the right, on the y-axis, shows microsatellite instability frequency and on the x-axis various cancer types. The three cancers with the highest, around 20 to 30 percent MSI high frequency, are colon, stomach, and endometrial cancers. And these are the three sample types that we performed analytical validation on our kitten, which I'll show data for later. So the next few, the remainder of the talk will actually focus on the background of what our kit, um, what is included in our kit and the performance of it. Here are the key features of it. Um, so in the beginning, I showed a tumor and normal sample run on fragment analysis. With this kit, you don't have to run the normal control, although um, you can. Um, it, after you do your fluorescent PCR, you take the file that comes off the capillary electrophoresis instrument and import it into our software, and it'll automatically make an overall call in that sample if it has microsatellite instability or not. In the chemistry of the kit, we have 13 MSI markers, which is eight more than the predominant assay on the market right now plus two sample identification markers, PENTA-D and THO1. These are included so that if there are any sample mix-up or contamination in your tumor or normal samples, you can identify those. You only need two nanograms of FFP DNA, so very little amount is used for this assay. And you can get results in as little as four hours with less than a one hour hands-on time. We performed analytical validation on the Seek Studio and 3500 series, but we have customers that are also running it on the 3730 and are showing really good results. The software that I mentioned that comes with the kit is provided at no additional cost. Here's the workflow for the chemistry. After you've extracted the DNA from the FFD samples, you uh, is a 15 minute PCR sample prep you take that, put it on a thermocycler for two hours, and then another fragment analysis sample prep. Run that on the capillary electrophoresis instrument, take the FSA file and import it into our software. In four hours, you've got your overall call. 
Here are the MSI markers that are included in the kit. Eight of them are publicly known MSI markers. Some of these are the Bethesda markers. Some of these are uh, markers known in the literature or previously used to detect microsatellite instability in multiple different cancer types. We've also included five MSI markers proprietary to applied biosystems that were shown to be quasi-monomorphic, which means that they have the same allele across multiple ethnic populations, and that's really important in the tumor only in mode. And um, they were also shown to be extremely sensitive in multiple different cancer types. These are the two sample identification markers, PENTA-D and THO1. Uh, PENTA-D is a pentanucleotide repeat and THO1 is a tetranucleotide repeat. Here I'm showing a representative colorectal carcinoma um, figure. On the left is the tumor and on the right is the normal. There are, these are all of the different dye channels here. There are five different ones, BAM, FIC, MED, TAS and SID. And um, you can see here in the tumor sample an extra set of peaks that represent smaller amplicons or deletions in the tumor sample at each of the different MSI markers here and here and others. And this, these um, two distinct uh, um, peaks here are the sample identification markers. And you can see that they're the same allele in both the tumor and normal, uh, which lets you know that these both came from the same sample or from the same individual. So we performed analytical validation on greater than 150 research samples from colorectal, gastric, and endometrial cancers. And I'm gonna show a few examples of these on the next slide. So here are examples of deficient mismatch repair, MSI high, colon, gastric, and endometrial research samples. And once again, you can see that this very distinctive deletion in the tumor sample for in the colon and gastric and in the endometrial samples here. So the next two a few slides are going to show examples of why we wanted to develop an automatic calling algorithm and software. So this uh, is a colorectal research cancer sample, and I'm showing the FAM channel. And it's in a case of an example, it's an example of an obvious and subtle microsatellite instability. So on the x-axis, once again, we have the amplicon size from small to large. And on the y-axis, we have the peak height or fluorescence. In blue is the normal and in green is the tumor. And here you can see an eight base pair separation between the normal sample and the tumor sample. So this example here is really obvious. In NR21, the difference between the tumor and normal is only one base pair. And so this can be really difficult to make a call by the human eye. So that's why we wanted to develop a algorithm that can do this for you to detect these really challenging cases. We also developed synthetic contracts to help train the algorithm and to help give an example of uh, how these small, smaller deletions are really challenging to detect by the human eye. So uh, in this example, the tumor is blue and the normal is black. And all of these examples are from one marker, I believe it's NR21 at 20% variant allele frequency. So at five base, about five base pairs, 20% VAF, you can readily see the extra set of peaks. But as you decrease in the base pair deletion size, that is increasingly hard to detect by the human eye. So having an algorithm that can detect these smaller deletions is really helpful. Here um, I show the results for the tumor normal analysis. In, uh, let me back up. We actually have two different algorithms in the software, one for tumor normal analysis. So if you provide the normal sample and a tumor sample, and we used those greater than 150 gastric, endometrial, and colon samples to tune and train the algorithm to maximize sensitivity and specificity on both the 3500 and Seek Studio genetic analyzers. And you can see that we have a really good area and a curve score here across each of these different 
sets of data which represent groups of data with different base pair deletion sizes. This slide shows the performance of the algorithm in tumor-only analysis, so we're not using a normal sample here. And on the x-axis, you can see the estimated deletion size, and on the y-axis, you can see the sensitivity. And as you increase the deletion size, you increase your sensitivity, which, is, which makes sense. It's hard to detect very subtle deletions of one base pair in, um, without having a normal sample. And that's relevant because in endometrial samples, those uh, roughly 20% of endometrial samples have uh, really subtle deletions of around one to two base pairs. And so we recommend not using tumor-only analysis in this particular sample type. This is more amenable to colon and gastric samples. And we have comparable performance between both of the platforms, 3500 and Sig Studio. This slide shows the concordance between our PCR-based assay and immunohistochemistry. So we performed immunohistochemistry in all of those 150 samples that I mentioned. And in, uh, here we can see that we have around a 90% concordance between the Trumark MSI assay and the IHC. This is a good result because Roughly 50% of the samples in this data set are extremely challenging. It's those endometrial samples that I mentioned that have really subtle deletions that have been historically hard to detect by PCR because there's only a one to two base pair shift and we're detecting them at a really good level. This next slide compares the performance between the Promega MSI test and IHC. And you can see that their system has an 83% accuracy or much lower than uh, the TrueMark MSI test. And the ProMega test had roughly 17 no calls, and in the TrueMark MSI assay was able to make four, a call on 14 of those 17 samples. So our assay was more robust and more accurate. One of the reasons why the, our assay was more accurate is because the ProMega assay only uses five markers, and didn't perform as well in those endometrial samples. So having those additional markers on the TrueMark MSA assay allowed us to pick up those small instabilities that were missed by the ProMega system. I'm going to pivot now to describing the software and the various features within the software that are available. So firstly, the software only works with the TrueMark MSI assay and it allows for automatic calling of markers and samples. And you can use um, a tumor normal or just a tumor sample to make those automatic calls. There are QC features in there, and if you want, you can have review and auditing. There are individual specimen reviews and batch views and you can export these specimen reports and batch reports in various different format types. If you would like to download the software, you can download it from thermofisher.com slash MSI software. Here on the right is a picture of a specimen, and this is a specimen data view looking at the FAM channel. There are three markers in the FAM channel here. On the top is the tumor sample, on the bottom is the normal, and you can see an extra set of peaks clearly in the tumor sample here. And on the right, the call is correct for each of these different samples. You can make a manual call if you disagree with this automatic call, and I'll show an example of that on the next slide. In this particular example, um, once again, we have the tumor on top and the normal on the bottom. This is in a different channel with four different markers in it. Here we have the automatic call as stable for ABI 17 here. And we can visually see that there is an extra set of peaks. Uh, I would go ahead and call this microsatellite unstable for this particular marker. And you can modify that over here in the manual call section and it'll update this unstable call for the specimen at the top. So if you disagree with any of the automatic calls, you can change them. Here's a stack to view where the tumor is displayed over the normal, but you can also click this button here to overlay the tumor and normal 
to confirm that this is indeed a microsatellite unstable marker. And here's what that looks like. The normal is in blue, or I'm sorry, it's in brown, and the tumor is in blue. And you can clearly see that extra set of stutter peaks in the tumor sample. And we can go ahead and confirm this manual call change. These are the two different report formats that we have. You have a specimen level report and a batch summary report. In the specimen level report, it tells you for that specimen how many markers were unstable, stable, or were un the algorithm was unable to make a call in, and the reported unstable rate. If you made any comments on here about the sample, you, those would show up right here. It also has the marker details where the electropharograms for each of the individual markers and their call are displayed here as well for review. And you can see whether or not the HID markers um, are the same between the tumor and normal so that there's no sample contamination. In the report are also other metadata information on the analysis version of the software and um, some other features. In the batch summary report, if you run, you know, a full plate of samples, you can get an overall, a quick view for the overall call of each of those individual samples on there. If there were any warnings, how many unstable or stable um, calls there were, whether or not um, it was able to make a match between the sample identification markers. If you reviewed it, if you've edited it at all, um, that's all exportable in multiple different formats, PDF, CSV. So in summary, the TrueMark MSI assay achieves robust identification of MSI with low sample input. And we developed the software um, that has, that is really quick um, and it has high sensitivity and specificity in calling microsatellite instability. You can also use this assay and software without a normal in colon and gastric research samples, which cuts down the cost of sample in half. If you want to learn more about the essay, you can visit the website here at thermofisher.com slash MSI. And with that, I will take any questions that you have. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Dr. Baldo, for that outstanding presentation. We will now move into the live Q&A portion of the presentation. As a reminder, please submit your question via the Q&A box. There are several questions coming in now. Let's take a look at the first one. How do you compare MSI on Senga versus on NGS? Great first question. Yeah, I think MSI has on Singers um, has two big advantages. One is its cost is really cheap and it's technologically easy to perform. But you can also physically see the evidence of the instability on electropharogram you can make that judgment call for yourself and look at those peaks and compare them between your tumor and normal samples and truly see that it is unstable or unstable. On NGS, you get, you have this, a, you know, an arbitrary NGS cutoff score and you can't physically see that instability in yourself. So there's power to be able to look at the evidence on your own and make that judgment call. I think the next question we have here, uh, is more on the data analysis. Uh, what do you recommend running a PET normal for endometrial tissue? Are there other types of cancer tissue that need a normal match too? So we developed the assay with the aim of not requiring a paranormal tissue sample, and the sensitivity is comparable to running both a normal and a matched tumor in colorectal and gastric research samples. However, we do recommend running a normal match for endo samples as microsatellite instability is difficult to detect in the sample type due to very small, often one to two base pair changes in about 20% of the MSI high cases. 
I'm not aware of other cancer types that pose similar challenges, but I'm also not sure that that research has been done in cancers where uh, that have low MSI frequency since it's hard to acquire a large enough number of MSI samples in those cases. I think that'd make for a good research project though to look into. So it sounds like uh, we do not need a, a PET samples to actually analyze the data, but uh, how does the software make the analysis without the extra uh, uh, mesh PET control? For the tumor-only analysis, there's a database of samples known to be stable that the algorithm compares to, and this accounts for any natural variation in allele size that's out there. That sounds perfect uh, for 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 the for the utility in the lab. So I think we have another question coming up more on the markers that are being used on the panels. Uh, how, how are these markers selected, and how are they prioritized? Yeah, so there are 13 MSI markers on the panel. Eight of the markers have been historically used in the detection of colorectal cancer, and we've added five preparatory markers. And we selected these five because they were shown to be monomorphic, which means that they have the same allele across multiple ethnic populations. And these five markers were also selected because they showed high sensitivity across multiple cancer types, not just colorectal, and because they're, you know, they're just the right, the right size of around 20 base pairs. Too large of a homopolymer, and you see more natural variation of homopolymer size than normal samples, which challenges MSI interpretation, and too small, and the instability profiles are harder to see. Thank you. I think the next question we can go to is, is more on Lynch syndrome. I think you covered this very much earlier in the presentation. Uh, that both germline and somatic mutation play a role in MMR deficiency in Lynch syndrome patient, or is it just germline? In Lynch, Lynch syndrome in and of itself, I'm pretty sure that's just the hereditary form, so germline, but um, MSI is, can result from somatic mutations as well. Thank you. I think the next one we can look into is um, the clinical comparison, I think. Uh, for the um, negative predictive value and positive predictive value analysis. How is the true positive and true negative uh, determined? Is it clinically? We use the um, the truth call as the whatever result was from the immunohistochemistry. So each of these um, samples were stained with uh, four different MMR uh, proteins. And if they had deficiencies in any one of the four, those were considered DMMR, and that was the truth that we considered. So, uh, so the numbers that's presented there uh, is uh, including this, any of these concordance data, it, we, so it's not kind of like the true positive or, or true negative, or is it just a concordance data? Yeah, you can. I would think of it more of concordance to IHD. I see. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. The next question uh, we we have here is uh, more of a sample type. Um, does true mark MSI analysis software have any peak normalization during automated calling? Uh, is the sample input from uh, FFP only or blood as well? Okay, two-part question. So for the first part, yes, there is normalization in the algorithm because uncorrected large amplification differences between the tumor and normal samples could trip up the algorithm. So we do account for that in the uh, calling of MSI. And, but the peak normalization isn't shown in the electropharogram, so you can't actually see that normalization happening on the visual side, although that's a feature that we might add to the software in the future. And the second part of that question um, was, I think it was, uh, can you use blood as well? Um, and so we developed the assay for and tested it on FFP samples. Um, although we do have current customers that are trying it on liquid biopsy samples and the results are really similar. We plan to put an app note or poster out later sometime this year showing the performance in blood samples, but I don't have a time frame for that yet. Perfect. <laughs> So um, just one last question before uh, we conclude the discussion. 
Um, can we use the current Gene Mapper software uh, on the assays that you just shared with us? You can use GMapper, but it doesn't support automated calling and reporting. If you want those features, then you'll need to use the MSI analysis software. But if you'd still like to use GeneMapper to help troubleshoot, for instance, then you can absolutely do that, and you'll be able to find the analysis settings and panels on our MSI software webpage in the new future. And um, I think that's all the time we have. Uh, as a final reminder, any questions uh, that were submitted and are not answered today by our speakers will be addressed through email. And uh, with that, I, I would like to uh, thank our speaker, Dr. Baldo, for sharing his insights on the MSI. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Sure. So next, our next speaker uh, who will join us is uh, Dr. Yusoki Hirosu from Japan. Dr. Hirosu is the Chief Researcher, Genome Analysis Center in Yamanashi Central Hospital in Japan. For a complete biography on our speaker, please visit the tab at the top of your screen. His research is focused on the genetic profile, liquid biopsy, and translational research using clinical specimens. Today, he will be sharing with us on the topic, Cancer Genomics Research on Tumor Clonality and Liquid Biopsy. His presentation will be in Japanese. However, English caption will be made available. If any question arise during the presentation, we encourage you to submit them in the Q&A box. Our speaker will address your question following his presentation. With that, please join me in welcoming Dr. Hirosu. Now, I will turn the presentation over to him.え、関係者の皆様方ありがとうございます。え、私は山梨県立中央病院ゲノム解析センターの広津と申します。え、本日お話しするトピックは、え、膀胱がん患者の中で、え、当院で次世代シーケンス解析をしたデータになり、え、
治療前と後に定時的に複数回採血を行いましたそして血小中のセルフリー DNA に残存する使用由来の変異の推移を調べました免疫チェックポイント阻害剤の治療効果が得られなかった患者さんでは変異の割合が一定に推移しています一方で、えー、効果が得られた患者さんでは治療開始後2週目で DNA の割合が減衰していることが示されましたこのように進行がん患者の血中に流れ出ている変異を解析することで治療効果のモニタリングに使えることが示されましたで先ほどのように血液を使ったリキッドバイオプシーの解析は以前から行われデータが蓄積してきていますしかし血液の解析では進行がん患者さんのような大きな腫瘍やあるいは転移が認められるような場合は変異の検出ができたとしてもがん、えー、の小さい、えー、早期のがんの場合はいまだ困難な場合がありますその理由として考えられることは、えー、早期がんの場合には腫瘍系が小さく、えー、血,血液に流れ出る変異の DNA 量が少ないことが挙げられますそうした微量な変異の DNA を検出するためには分子パーコードなどを使ったより高感度の発生系を構築,し構築していくというアプローチがありますまた別のアプローチとしては血液以外の主要由来の DNA が多く存在する検体を探すということがあります我々は以前に肺がんの手術をした患者を対象に術前に腕から採血した末梢血と肺静脈のどちらに多くの変異 DNA が存在するか調べましたするとちょうど肺の出口にあたる肺静脈の方が変異 DNA を高頻度に同定できることを見出していましたしたがってがんの組織からより近い場所から得られる検体体液というのが最もその変異がの DNA が豊富に存在すると考えられますで膀胱がんを対象にした場合腫瘍に直接接している尿のサンプルがベストなサンプルであり尿を使えば早期のがんが検出できるのではないかと考えましたそこでまず膀胱がんの遺伝子変異を検出するためにイワンプリセックデザイナーよりカスタムパネルを作成しました TCGA などの国際的なヒトゲノムのがんデータベースの情報を参考にして膀胱がん、前立腺がん、腎がんなど泌尿器がんに関わる遺伝子を71個ピックアップしましたそしてこの71遺伝子のエクソン領域をカバーする365キロベースペアを対象にしたパネルをインハウスで作成しアンプリコンシーケンスに使いましたこちらが使用したキットの一覧になりますサーモフィッシャーサイエンティフィック社の製品を使っております上からライブラリの作成にはインワンプリセックライブラリキットプラスそのライブラリの生成にはアンピュアビーズを使い当院では自動で抽出するキングフィッシャーディオプライムシステムを使っていますライブラリの濃度の測定はイオンライブラリタックマンクオンティフィケーションキットで測定しシーケンスの前処理にあたるエマルジョン PCR とチップ A のローディングはイオンシェフで行いシーケンス解析はイオンプロトンで行いましたこちらは対象となる患者さんです膀胱がんの患者さん25名と良性腫瘍の患者さん5名になりますがんの患者さんのうち17名は非浸潤がんで8名が浸潤がんです1人の患者さんから5種類の検体を集めました具体的にはバフィーコート、血症、自然尿から延伸して得られる鎮査と情勢、そしてがんの組織ですなおバフィーコートはコントロールと,使用しとして使用しそれ以外のサンプルの体細胞変異を検出しましたこちらはサンプルの調整の手順になります軽尿道的膀胱腫瘍切除術 TURBT を受ける前に
真正血と自然尿を回収します真正血は延伸してバフィーコートと結晶に分離しました尿は一部を臨床診断のために通常の細胞診検体に使い残ったあまりの検体を延伸して情勢と鎮査に分けて検体を得ましたまた TURBT の術後に得られた病理標本からがん細胞をアークチュアスレーザーキャプチャーマイクラダイセクションで得ましたそれでそれぞれの検体から DNA を抽出し先ほどのカスタムパネルのプライマーで増幅後ライブラリー作成をしていきましたでこちらは使用変異のデータ一覧になります今回作成したカスタムパネルで使用のゲノムを調べてみるとすべての検体で少なくとも一つの体細胞変異が同定されましたその中のいくつかの変異はクロマチンリモデリングに関わる遺伝子,遺伝子のトランケーティングミューテーションや P53 の DNA 血液ト変異あるいは PI3K のホットスポット変異でオンコジェニックなポテンシャルを有する変異が多く見つかっています次に尿の DNA の正常について解析しました尿の DNA サイズをアガロンスゲルで見ていますこちらはリプレゼンタティブな6名の尿の鎮査と情勢から得られたサンプルを流しています尿の鎮査からは高分子の断片化されていない長い DNA が観察されますそれに比べて情勢から抽出した DNA は断片化が起きていました尿の情勢に関してより詳細な DNA サイズを調べるためバイオアナライザーで解析しました尿の情勢に関してはいくつかはフラグメントのピークがあり一番多いものがちょうど170から190ベースペアの間でしたこれはちょうどヒストン一巻分より少し長い DNA 断片長に相当するものでしたこうしたフラグメントパターンですけれども結晶のセルフリー DNA のパターンによく似ていますアンプリコンサイズよりも長い DNA サイズが得られるということが分かりましたので実際に NGS の解析に進みました先ほど示した5つのサンプルを25名の患者に関して調べていますこちらがそのうちの1名の患者さんから得られたゲノムのデータをヒートマップで示しています横方向にサンプルタイプが表記され左から順に腫瘍、尿の醸成、尿の鎮査、結晶にの順に並んでいます縦方向には遺伝子名とアミノ酸,アミノ酸変化が表記されています、えー、変異がある部分が青いボックスで示され、えー、色の濃淡がバリアントアリルフラクリークエンシーを示していますで肺のの部分は変異を認めなかった箇所になりますでこのケースですと使用で同定された変異が、えー、ヒートマップでそれぞれのサンプルで存在しているということが確認できます。で尿,尿の情勢と鎮査には変異が検出されていますが今回この方に関しては結晶中には同定されていませんこうした解析を25名に行っていますがこちらは最初の15名のデータを示しています全体的な傾向としては腫瘍と同一の変異が尿中から検出されますが結晶からは検出されないケースが多いですまた腫瘍中で色の濃い部分すなわちバリアントアレルフリーケンシーが高い部分のところから尿中に漏れ出しているというとことがある程度相関を持っているということが分かりましたまた残りの受賞例についても同じような傾向が得られていますなお良性腫瘍の方から尿中の変異は見つかってきておりません変異の数についてまとめると使用中には全体で168変異が同定されました使用組織と同一の変異がどれぐらいそれぞれのサンプルにあるか見ると尿の醸成には89個尿の鎮査には81個
一方で決勝地にはわずか3位変異のみ同定されました次に尿の醸成と鎮査に見つかった変異と臨床の背景について調べました尿の醸成鎮査いずれにおいても非浸潤がんに比べて浸潤がんの方がバリアントアレルフリーケンシの高い傾向がありましたまた細胞診の診断と比較するとクラス1からクラス3に比べてクラス5の方がバリアントバリアフリーケンシが高いことが分かりました通常膀胱がんのフォローアップには細胞診検体を使った検査を行いますので尿のゲノム解析との診断感度について評価しましたこちら全25症例で見てみますと尿のゲノム解析はルーチンで行う細胞診検査よりも優れた感度を有しています浸潤がんと非浸潤がんで分けてみると特に真ん中の棒グラフにある非浸潤がんの場合細胞診では 22% の診断率にとどまりますが尿のゲノム解析では約7割と優位に高くなります一方、浸潤がんでは細胞診検体でも高い診断感度が得られており尿のゲノム診断との優位な差は認められませんでしたしたがって非浸潤がんのような早期がんにおいて尿のゲノム解析は優れた診断感度があることが示されました次に尿中から薬剤に対応するアクショナブルな変異が見つかるかどうか検討しましたアクショナブルな変異の数は尿の醸成、鎮査にそれぞれ21あすみません、22 21 21で結晶は1変異のみでしたこれらの具体的な分子機能としては DNA の修復やクロマチンリモデリング PI3KAKT や RTK マップカイネスの経路などになりましたこの中で我々は DNA 修復に関わる ERCC2 という分子に注目しましたこの ERCC2 ですが膀胱がんでは約 7% で変異が同定されていますこの分子はヌクレオチド除去修復に関わり変異がある場合には脱菌製剤に対し感受性を示すことが分かっています我々が同定したのは4種類のミスセンス変異になりますでこの後でのスライドで紹介する症例は閉経スドメインのにある606番目のコロンのアミノ酸変異を有しておりこの部位は生物主観で保存されていますこの4種類のミスセンス変異について分子機能を因子自己解析であるシフトオリフェン2キャットスコアによりますといずれもパソジェニックな変異であることが予想されました次にこのスライドで紹介する症例ですがクリニカルステージが4で筋層浸潤両側の骨盤内にリンパ節転移を認める症例です TRBT から得られたがんの組織から ERCC2 のコロン606番目の変異が見つかっていますこの方は実前化学療法で白金製剤による治療を受けています黄色い矢印に示すように治療前はリンパ節の転移の部分が腫れていましたこの方は腎機能が悪かったためエムシタービンとカルボプラチンの実前化学療法を受けていますすると先ほどのリンパ節の転移はどんどん見えなくなるまで縮小されていましたこの方はその後膀胱全摘をしましたがその病理,的な標本病理学的な標本からは腫瘍の残存病変は観察されなかったとの所見を得ていますその後この方をフォローを行っていますが1年半再発することなく順調な経過を見ていますまたあのこの症例では治療前後の尿のサンプルを取ってましたので治療前後の尿のゲノム解析をしましたすると治療前に観察される変異は治療後には尿中から完全に消失していました
。したがって尿の解析は治療のモニターにも有効であることが示唆されました。最後に尿の解析から使用の再発が予測できないか調べましたまず臨床学的に再発していない11例です白抜きの赤い丸が尿中に残存する変異がなく赤く塗られた丸が尿中に残存する変異が認められたサンプルですこの11例の再発のない群では一番上の症例で最初のタイミングの尿には変異が残存していましたがその後は消えています他の症例では残存する変異は認められていませんその後経過を追ってますが臨床的な再発は今のところ認められていませんこちらは再発を認めた5例になりますいずれにおいても残存病変を認めています興味深いことに臨床的な再発が確認される前に長い方だと3ヶ月前からすでに尿中に変異が検出されていましたさらに何名かの症例では細胞診ではクラス1と診断されているにもかかわらず尿中からは変異が検出されていました以上より膀胱がんでは尿が理想的なリキッドバイオプシーであると考えています尿は膀胱がんの腫瘍のゲノムプロファイルを示しており再発を予見できると考えますまた通常の一般的な検査で行われる細胞診検査では診断できないような早期の膀胱がんの診断にも有効であると考えられました以上ですご清聴ありがとうございました Thank you Dr. Hirosu for that outstanding presentation Unfortunately,、uh, Dr. Hirosu can't join us live today as he is being called away at the very last minute. This also means that Dr. Hirosu is, un is unable to answer your question live today. However, please rest assured we will consolidate your question to him and get back to you through email after the event. Thank you for joining us for the last two sessions for the clinical oncology session. From here, we will take a 15 minute break before we start the next session. So please go and have good coffee. Visit our booth at the exhibition hall. There are seven different booths segmented by field of interest. Learn about some of our exciting promotion that is made available to you. There will be thermal official representatives at each booth looking into any inquiries you might have. On top of that, please participate in our scavenger hunting game. Look up our icons in the environment to win special prizes. Lastly, there will be a pop up survey appearing in a minute. Please help us to complete the survey. Let us know how we do. With that, Thank you very much. It's been extremely enjoyable speaking to all of you. Thank you, and I'll see you in another 15 minutes' time. Thank you.